Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. What happens when you fuse internal culture and external brand? Hello everyone, Kevin Cruz here. Welcome to the LeadX Show, where once again, we are helping you to stand out and to get ahead at work and at home. Of course, what it means to get ahead at home, I don't know. I think it means awesome family life, great strong marriage, your kids love you, you love your kids, all is well. <laughs> Imagine for a second though, that you could generate massive employee engagement at work on your team, and as a bonus, all your team members, they thought you were the best boss they ever had. Well, I personally teach the fundamentals of effective feedback, one-on-one -on -one meetings, coaching, goal setting, and like, I don't know, six or seven courses on, or lessons on employee engagement. All of this is up in the Lead X Academy. It's free for three days. Just go consume all this training and check it out for three days. And it's almost free after that. Check it out at leadx.org. Our quote of the day, one of my favorites, to win in the marketplace, you must first win in the workplace. That comes from the great Doug Conant. Friend of mine, fellow Philadelphian, gotten a chance to get to know Doug. Of course, he is the former CEO of Campbell Soup. Great turnaround story there. And just a great example of like wholehearted, heart-based leadership. And another friend and guru who I respect immensely is our guest today. She's the go-to expert on brand building and an in-demand speaker and consultant. She's the author of the best-selling book, What Great Brands Do, and she's here to talk about her new book, Fusion, How Integrating Brand and Culture Powers the World's Greatest Companies. Our guest is Denise Leon. Denise, welcome to the show. Hello, Kevin. All right, so we're going to be talking about your new book in just a minute, but... I ask all of our guests the same first question because I love failure stories. I always think, you know, it's it's not win or lose, it's win or learn. And selfishly, I want to learn from your failures, not just my own. So give me one of your best failures. It's nice to start off with a softball question, right, Kevin. Right. I love it, right? <laughs> um, okay, so I... I am an overachiever, as you can imagine, being, you know, an Asian female, uh, you know, <laughs> straight A student, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, for my 40th birthday, I had set out my goal to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Wow. And it was because, you know, I had wanted to do something significant. I had seen this movie where these young kids actually summited Kilimanjaro. So I'm like, if those kids can do it, come on, I can do it. And I'm in pretty good shape. So, you know, we plan this huge trip. My husband goes with me. We have this awesome experience getting there, starting on the hiking trip. And then kind of midway through, I started to get really sick. And I think mm. it was a combination of altitude sickness and maybe some food poisoning or whatever. Anyway, there it was not a pretty sight. And so ultimately what ended up happening is this goal of summoning Kilimanjaro for my 40th birthday did not happen. I got up to like 16,000 feet. And then I was just like, there's no way I can get up any further. And what was significant about that is that because I'm an achiever, I didn't want to have to come back and tell all these people who I had said, I'm climbing Kilimanjaro mm. to tell them that I had failed. But that was actually the best thing that, that could have happened to me. I, I had to learn how to tell people and to own up to just the fact that I didn't accomplish something that I set out to do. And that was okay. You know, we, we're not always going to succeed. We're not always going to meet our goals, but at least we tried. And, and I had a good time while I was doing it despite, despite being sick. So to me, that was, it was the hardest thing to admit that I hadn't, hadn't succeeded in my goal, but it was probably the best thing. Yeah, that's an amazing story. And it's not one I realized that that had that had happened in the moment. Like, so you're sick, you're 16,000 feet. Were you just so physically sick? Like you knew, like, there's no way I can make it. And this thing, just get me off this mountain. Or was it like, oh my gosh, yeah. I can't leave. Like, this is heartbreaking. What was it like? Yeah, it was both. So what happens is the night, so you start climbing to the summit 
um, you get up around midnight so that you can start climbing around two o'clock. And so we all had kind of gone to bed around nine or 10 o'clock. We, I got up at midnight. They tried to feed me something and, and not to get too graphic, but it basically just kind of went yeah. through my system. So, you know, we get all suited up and we start climbing and within like 20 minutes, I was exhausted and I thought, okay, I have to climb another 10 hours to get to the summit. Right. There's no way that I'm going to do that. And so I had this real internal battle of, do I just push myself and maybe, you know, there's a point about exhaustion and, and you know, I don't know what would happen up there right. or do I just make the decision this isn't going to happen and I'm going to have to live with it. And I ended up doing the latter, you know, and I think that that, that deliberate choice to say I'm walking away from my goal, w again, was kind of part of that learning experience of saying, be OK with that, you know, own it right. and be OK with it. Yeah. And this is something that in my own life, uh, I've, I'm, I'm 50 now, so I've mellowed out a little bit. But as a former <laughs> super high achiever, you know, I did realize that so much of achievement is about external validation, you know, where, Absolutely, where am I on that yes. bestseller list or yes. that ink list or whatever it is? Yes. And to, it takes some wisdom to realize, all right, it really is about the journey and the process, not the ultimate goal there at the end. Yeah. I think we, we all spend way too much time managing perceptions right. as opposed to enjoying what we're doing. And so that was a real, a, a real turning point for me. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. And again, your new book is Fusion, how integrating yes. brand and culture powers the world's greatest companies. And you say in most companies, you know, internal culture and external brand, they're very disconnected and they actually operate in different silos. So tell us more about that. Like, what is the dysfunction that's going on out there? Yeah. Well, if you think about it, I think, you know, most CEOs or top leaders in an organization, when they think about culture, who do they think of? human resources, right? Okay, right. we just need to get the HR folks to take care of our people. And then when they think about brand building, who do they think of? Marketing. And so, you know, HR is off here doing something, marketing is off here doing something else. And so the efforts really aren't aligned and integrated. And so there's a huge disconnect that can form when you don't have these two things aligned, integrated, or as I call, fused together. One of the disconnects is just your employees get confused about if my cultural values or my, you know, HR is saying one thing, but then marketing is saying our brand is something else, what, what's really important? You know, so there's, there's some confusion internally, but I think the bigger risk is confusion and disconnect externally. I, you know, quite frankly, I think that's why we've seen right. something like uh, the Wells Fargo situation happen, where you know, what, with their with their employees opening false accounts and doing all these other other unethical practices, that's bad in and of itself. But I think what right. was particularly surprising is that I think we all thought Wells Fargo was this very wholesome kind of old yeah. fashioned company. They've got the stagecoach. They've got the you know holiday ads with the snowmen, making sure that you know you get your packages in time. And so there was this real disconnect for customers to say, "Well, wait a minute," you know, like. We might have expected some other bank to be engaged in these cutthroat practices, right. but not our, our good old Wells Fargo. So there is often this disconnect that has big consequences. Yeah. And when when I um when I read your book, a couple of things that that stood out at me when you talk about this disconnect, it made me realize. So, you know, my background is more from that HR side, employee engagement side. And there are a lot of HR people I know, heads of HR, who get all excited about like employment branding. So they're trying to attract candidates to hire employees. And so now they start working on these branding and campaign things for representing internal culture. And yet they almost all go out and get their own ad agencies <laughs> or separate agencies that are, you know, employment branding agencies completely separate from the brand agencies that the rest of their company's working with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But but I it did make me wonder like, okay, so if we're supposed to fuse the internal culture, our internal brand with our external brand, like which comes first? Because in existing companies, like they're both churning along. So like, how do we get them in sync or what drives what? Yeah, I would say either or or both, okay. you know, it really kind of depends. I think it depends on probably which is stronger for mm. you as an organization. So the example I'll give 
is when I was at Sony Electronics. This was back in, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And we had undergone a real investigation of what the Sony brand meant and should continue to, to mean to customers in the new digital age. And we had developed a, a newly inspired brand vision and, and values, et cetera. And as we started to engage people internally with that, I started to work at the HR department. And, and to your point, in the past, they had gone you know, to their own agency, developed their own ads for recruitment. But what they realized is those ads that they had been creating were very generic. You know, they talked about, you know, great benefits and a pleasant working environment, blah, blah, blah. Whereas when they started to see, well, our brand is all about innovation and an imagination and, yeah, innovating to your an engineer's or a designer's heart's content, they realized that was a real powerful platform that they could use for their employment branding. So in that case, because the brand seemed to be stronger, more unique, more compelling, we worked together, and this was one of the best, I think one of my greatest points about working at Sony was HR and the brand department worked together to create this whole employment brand that was in sync with our consumer brand. But I will say that, you know, there are other companies where the culture is stronger than the brand. And one of the examples I talk about in the book is REI, the outdoor retailer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were started with these values of the love of the outdoors. And everyone who works there definitely embraces those the, that, that mission of getting outdoors. And so a few years ago, as, as the company was thinking about, well, how do we commemorate our culture? They decided for Black Friday, you know, the most critical day in retail sales, they were actually going to give their employees the day off. And to encourage employees, instead of working inside, go outdoors. And then that turned into this opt outside campaign, which ended up being such a strong brand campaign for the company. Right. But it started with the genesis of their culture being so special. So I think it can really be either or, or maybe sometimes it's a matter of bringing them both together. Yeah, and, and it's it's almost now an overused word now. But but I think if it does come from culture and then go goes out – it does feel like a more authentic brand. I mean, it really is truly like REI. You walk in and the people that work there love to be outdoors, right? They love, they know the stuff. And uh, it's not because they've been trained in it or they passed a product knowledge quiz. So that whole cutting through all of the fakeness to get an authentic brand, uh, it does seem like it can come from, you know, inside out and, and strengthen that way. So you mentioned Sony, you mentioned REI. You have another company or two you could share some insights about? Well, while I opened the book talking about Amazon, which I think is probably one of the most fascinating companies when you talk about brand and culture, especially in light of the New York Times expose that was written a few years ago. I don't know if, you're, if your watchers and followers will remember, but there was this article that was written in the New York Times about how horrible the culture was at Amazon. Um, I think it was painful, bruising, relentless, all these like horrible attributes. You know, there were reports of people crying at their desks and just succumbing to the you know, stress of, of trying to meet their manager's expectations. And I think that a lot of people's reaction to that article was Amazon sucks. You know, their corporate culture is horrible. Jeff Bezos, the CEO, is a workplace bully, et cetera, et cetera. But what was interesting is that there was a subsegment of responders that said, wait a minute, I work at Amazon and I love it here. Right. I love the competitive nature, the push to always be better. I love having a challenge that seems impossible and then meeting it all in service of becoming Earth's most customer-centric company, which is Amazon's mission. And so, you know, I think that that, that Amazon shows that, you know, your culture doesn't have to be right for everyone, but it has to be right for the people who are working in it. And you need to give them a reason why you're operating the way that you do. In Amazon's case, it was all about innovation and service of this extraordinary customer experience and customer service. And so it really makes sense that their brand and their culture are tightly woven together. They're mutually reinforcing. And it, I, I think that's a, a big part of the reason why they've been able to produce such phenomenal results. 
Yeah, I mean, really incredible company, Bezos and what he's done there. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by him. And I'm <laughs> with that example, I can remember when that article came out. I mean, it was an interesting reaction for me because I read the article and I didn't have a negative reaction about Bezos or the culture with what? my CEO hat, entrepreneur hat. I just thought like, okay, this is, you know, a, a high performance, high achieving, driven culture. And it had such a negative backlash that I was like, wow, there's a real disconnect here. And then to your point, it, it took a little while, but there was a counter argument that's saying, no, 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 like it, we're here because we want to be here and we're doing great things and they're not easy. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me of, of when you hear a lot of people who've worked worked for Steve Jobs. Right. They, they're not apologists for his worst moments. <laughs> I mean, they, everyone would acknowledge there's some things you just shouldn't do at work or you shouldn't treat people <laughs> a certain way. But they're quick to point out, I did my best work while working under jobs. We we put a dent in the universe yes. during that time. Yeah. You know, I th and, and this is a sign of good culture. Like it expels more people than it attracts, right? It's very unique. And if you don't want to work there, don't work there. That's a, that's a great quote, Kevin. You said that, you know, a sign of a, a good culture is that it expels more people than it attracts. I think that's so true. And I think that there's often this myth that in order for you to have a good culture, it needs to be kind of warm and fuzzy. Everyone needs to get along and kumbaya. And to your point, we're talking about two of the most valuable brands, two of the most successful businesses on the planet, and they both don't have those kinds of cultures. So I think that alone shows that there is no one right culture. There's the right culture for your organization, and that is uniquely tied to what your brand is all about, the value that you're creating for your customers and, and the debt in the universe that you want to make. Now, I mean, just this is just geeking out on this culture point a little bit more. I <laughs> was talking to uh, Patty McCord recently. So she was the former head of, of HR at Netflix and co-author of the Netflix Culture Deck. And it sort of surprised me. She says that when when she and Reed Hastings were, were growing Netflix, they, they asked her, like, what's your vision? She says, I want this to be a great place that you've come from. Like she fully intended people would go there for a few years and leave like but but that mm. she was upfront about that and to a lot of people again it's like none of this like oh we're we're a family and we're in it together forever and yes. here's our hundred year together plan <laughs> they were up front and said we're a team not a family and we're going to consistently put the best players on the field and she had her day come you know after a dozen years where they decided to part ways and she says yeah it stung but this is it was a great place for me to have spent some time and uh, it was very unique. Now, Denise, I got a tough question for you. One you're not prepped for either, <laughs> which Great. is so a lot of a lot of our listeners are going to be um, they're going to say, well, I'm a frontline manager in this big company. I don't I don't work in the marketing department. I don't work in the HR department. I'm not a VP of HR. And I'm just wondering, you know, to, uh, you know, a frontline leader out there, what do we tell her that she can do on her own team level to try to make brand and culture align a little bit better? Yeah, I, th I would say two things. One is to just communicate and try to connect the dots. Now, assuming that your organization has some degree of fusion or, you know, you don't have like a dysfunctional culture or a broken brand, right. I think a lot of it is just education and helping your employees understand that connection. The reason why we ask you to do this is because it's helping us deliver this to our customers or it's because we want to be known as this. So communication is, I think, really key. But I also think, and, and this is one of the things I talk about in my book, is being responsible for the daily employee experience is so critical for these frontline managers because sure there's a lot of design elements that happen at the kind of C level or you know kind of HR level where they're designing this experience but you know every day when your employees walk in are you going to reinforce your core values are you going to engage them are you going to be proactive and training them and developing them and helping them understand customers and helping them understand the brand there's so much that you can do just because you're interacting with your employees on a daily basis. And, you know, there's been so much work that's been done on customer experience design, taking a look at all the different steps in the customer experience journey and right. figuring out how to make them more valuable and, uh, and unique. The same opportunity applies for your employees. So think about, you know, the first day they show up for work, what kind of experience are they going to have? And what is that going to communicate to them about 
what they can expect from the company and and how how the company values them. So, you know, there's a lot that's really in the hands of these frontline managers. And, you know, I think it's just a matter of prioritizing it. Yeah, I I, I love that. And realizing it really is their job, even if they don't want to hear that, you know, the, like I said, HR can do what HR does. Marketing can maybe share their internal brand guidelines and, and all those things. But the frontline manager, whoever my boss is, they're the ones that are the filter of all this stuff. Do we give these things respect and time and attention? Or do we say, oh, more junk from HR, just toss, toss it away. Right. So everything goes through, through that, uh, through that filter. Yes. And I love this idea of employee experience design the same way we've been doing customer design. And if I were to ever have another professional services firm, which I don't want another one of those, <laughs> it would be in this area. I think it's so mm-hmm. interesting and high potential. And so for any other consultants out there, you know, who are tired of just doing traditional engagement, I mean, I think that's a, a hot area. So Denise, thank you so much. Tell our listeners, so how can they find out more about you and of course your new book, Fusion? Okay, great. Um, my website, deniseleeyan.com is probably the best place. From there, you'll be able to click on links that, that link you to my new book, Fusion. Also, you know, through social media, everything pretty much is my name, Denise Lee Yan. You'll be able to access great content as well as download tools and materials that will help you get started working on Fusion right away. That's great. You've always been very generous with giving a lot of great, valuable stuff away from your website. And we will put links in the show notes and in any articles to your website and places to get the book. Denise, thanks again for coming on to the Lead X Show. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's been great. Lead X family, that wraps up another episode filled with leadership advice. But before I go, I hope you remember that at Lead X, we're on a mission to give free leadership training and professional development to everyone, anywhere, at any time. Visit leadx.org to check out our free course of the day and our weekly live webinars. And for your friends and colleagues who are managers, they lead people, let them know that they can get over 30 best-in-class management training courses on demand at their own pace at leadx.org for a ridiculously low investment of $7 per month. This is our public beta pre-launch pricing, and that quadruples really soon. Check out the LeadX Academy at leadx.org. And if you're the kind of person who always says thank you, then please take one minute, it's actually less than a minute, and go leave a rating for the LeadX show on iTunes. Just go to leadx.org forward slash subscribe, And it's going to bounce you to the right page on iTunes. You can just click some stars, maybe click that subscribe button. And if you have 20 more seconds, you could write a one-sentence review of the show. It's the single best way for us to build our family. And of course, because leadership is influence and we are leading all of the time, it's a question of, are you leading in a positive direction or a negative direction? I implore you to be mindful with your influence, to be mindful with your leadership. How will you lead today?